Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is John Bentley. John is the founder of Power to Transform Consulting. John is a leadership coach, speaker, and trainer who helps healthcare organizations develop emotionally intelligent leaders and collaborative team players. John, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you, Howard. It's a joy to be here today. And for our listeners, John actually was one of our first guests on the Success Insight Podcast way back in early 2019. And I think, in fact, you probably have about three episodes that you have recorded with us. So I was really excited, John, for you to come back on the show because you know, I knowing your perspective and what the work that you're doing within healthcare organizations, I thought the conversation we could have today around your work and in light of this virus, the COVID-19 virus, this pandemic that is sweeping on a global scale. And I, I just wanted to get your perspective on your understanding of healthcare institutions. You're, you're a former military man, still working, you know, on behalf of the U.S. government. And I just thought your perspective as a leader, as well as a healthcare consultant might shed some light on what is going on in the healthcare fields today in terms of not so much the delivery of care, but what I would say is the delivery of self-care, either care that we initiate for ourselves or we as leaders, managers, initiate to help take care of our employees, our staff, during an environment that is incredibly stressful at this moment in time. So setting that stage, John, once again, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Yes, sir, Howard. And uh, what I found out in reaching out to some of my clients and customers and people that they referred me to is we've all heard the term, it's all hands on deck, especially those on the front line that are doing their best to take care of patients who have been identified with the COVID-19. And what I really didn't realize is the huge impact on those individuals and what they're facing. It reminds me of when I served in combat communications and we would deploy, take our communications gear out in the 1990s and set up. That The setup required a, a lot of initial work within 24 hours. Then just the ability to survive and operate really put a stress on us because we had no idea what may or may not happen. And I shouldn't say we had no idea. We had some intel but a lot of times that intel might have only been 60 or 70% accurate. So how do you respond to those situations you've never been in before, but also think about your emotional and mental well-being? And what I'm getting from two of the clients that I've talked to, one being a doctor and one being a nurse practitioner, is that healthcare people are going to struggle because they've never experienced anything like this before. You know, the flu comes pretty quickly and then something like SARS uh, lasts a long time. Well, this is both. It comes quickly and lasts a long time. So a great question you ask, how is it that we can prepare our healthcare professionals to take care of themselves with the limited amount of resources that they have to have an impact with this virus? Where does one start? They have had over the years, I would imagine, there's drills, there's education. My cousin who is in healthcare goes to classes once a year, you know, to get his continuing education credit. But from what you have seen, and in talking to these professionals, is there any type of preparation that would at least inform the healthcare practitioners? And, and by the way, we are talking not just the doctor who or the nurse practitioner who is at the apex of the healthcare organization, but going all the way down into the ancillary care and to the folks that help 
maintain the the operations inside the institution. So what is do you think has been available for them to date? And is this something that has to perhaps they have to relearn going forward once we come out the other end of this environment that we're in, this highly stressed environment? Well, just like me being in the military in combat communications, we always practice drills for things that may happen, such as natural disasters, a major piece of communication equipment going down or being destroyed. How do you reroute to make sure you've got what we call your primary communications up and running? I think in this case, and I don't know much about what my healthcare clients practice in these situations, but what I'm hearing is this is new. No one has ever faced this before. And there's constant changes daily just based on the information and intel that's coming out about the virus, what the government is asking us to do. And I I think the big thing is there's going to be waves of grief. and And as I said before, you're going to struggle. So how is it that we help people work through those and that grief? So I, I'm not so sure that that I have the answers. What I'm hearing, though, is that we take it on a case-by-case basis. I'll, I'll give you one example. It's not just taking care of the patient. It's taking care of yourself, trying not to catch the virus. And then suppose you're a mom, a dad. You've got elderly parents. You've got an ailing sister or sibling. Now you're going home and they want to be with you. You want to take care of them. However, it's probably very prudent for you to isolate yourself from them because you don't want to pass that on. And so I think it's what what I call, it's like changing a flat tire while the car is still moving. How do you do that? How do you fly the airplane and build it at the same time with the changes coming at you? And you and I both know that the brain craves certainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. So how do we help people stay focused on providing that health care? But at the same time, when there's a pause in that, how can we help each other? And I think one of the biggest things we can do is have peer-to-peer conversations. So take, for example, Howard, that you've experienced something traumatic that I have not. And now all of a sudden, I've gone through this traumatic moment where a patient passes away because of this coronavirus, and I've done everything that I knew to do, yet it's having a toll on me emotionally and mentally. How can I communicate with you? You show empathy, but also share with me a situation you went through and what you did to work through that. It sounds to me, John, that in these institutions, that in addition to the healthcare staff, we need the psychiatrists, the mental health professionals there to provide that, and maybe they are there for that matter, that kind of service in the moment when it's needed to help to work with that, that professional who's basically just watched a, a patient they've been caring for for days and, hour, and hours at a time. You know, how, how do they take in that grief, make some sense to it and move on? And do you have a sense? And again, this is kind of some of the questions we're going to ask today, or I'll ask are loaded because I know you may or may not have the answer, but do you think there is in these institutions staff that are available to provide this type of counseling in the event of a death like you've just described? I think there is that help there, but what I'm understanding from a couple of my clients is there seems to be more relief in talking with a peer who's lived it. And I'm not saying that clergy might not have lived it, and they can certainly provide that faith-based information. And what I don't want to do is turn Bible verses into a cliche. And, and, and you and I both know that if, if I can just understand and value your input and, and let you know that I care about you, that, that that can help sometimes take you from what I call that negative doomsday thought process, which, by the way, please don't have doomsday thoughts. It's going to put you in an emotional spiral that everything you see is going to relate to that doomsday. So in this case, if I'm having that and and I can relate to a peer who's gone through what I just experienced, they can help shift me from that doomsday to what I call neutral. So now I'm not Pollyanna and looking for everything to be perfect and changed in the moment. 
but I have what I call realistic optimism that I can do my best based on the resources we've been given to help as many patients and people as possible. So one of the actions that can take place when an event occurs is to potentially have someone appear who has experienced something similar be made available or be asked to be made available so that they can take a moment and to be with that practitioner who who perhaps had not faced that circumstance before and spend whatever time they need to help recenter them and to acknowledge what just happened. But now, okay, let's do our mourning. Now we've got to get back to work. Howard, I just love how you put that. That is absolutely right. That's what I am learning from talking with uh, people on the front lines, my, my healthcare customers and clients. I think empathy is so important. I think being able to paint reality of the situation we're facing is important because there's we want to save everyone, and that may not be possible based on the patient and, and who you're working with. And I'm not saying that you ignore, but through triage and through doing your best with the resources you have, part of that is, is saying, I know I did my best and that I did not violate any ethical or moral principles based on the situation. How do we ensure that the hospital has the institution, the office has that method or approach in place to provide that service? Do you think they're, do you think they're talking about that? Have they, are they doing that actively? I would say yes. In fact, uh, I know the one client that I have, their group has life counseling skills available to the organization. And they're, they're not charging for that. It's not a cost to the healthcare professionals. And they're also making that available to the healthcare professionals family. So they're, they're not just thinking about the individual. They're thinking about the, what makes up that individual. Do they have a loved one? Because when they go home, isolation could be right there for them. Or they may be isolated in the hospital. Well, what impact does that have? On, on my psyche, on my emotional and mental well-being, and just being able to help people find a routine within that and also include the family member in it as well, I think it helps set a, sets up a better opportunity for people to not tell themselves stories and react, but lets them respond. I'll also share with you, Howard, I have a friend here locally who's a sports psychologist and his wife is a licensed counselor. And what they're offering is telecounseling for the healthcare market or anyone who needs to talk or work through a situation based on COVID-19. So just as there's telemedicine for patients now that they're trying to keep that social distancing to determine whether you truly need to come to the hospital, I'm seeing opportunities to do telecounseling to help you effectively deal with whatever mental or emotional situation that may be occurring. I think that is a wonderful service that's being provided by the healthcare community, mental health community. And, and I, I've got to share, this is the first I've heard of that and the fact that it's available. So I guess the question would be in the communities in which we live, who is available to or what organization or a local, the local association is available to provide that service to the, the practitioner, to his or her family when it is needed? And wh what is that number they need to call and where do they go to find it? What resource do they need to go to find these, this contact information? Yeah, I'm so glad that you, you mentioned that, Howard. And what I would encourage your listening audience, if any of them provide counseling services, to maybe consider volunteering X number of hours, even if it's only four a week, to some type of, of telecounseling and determine what systems that could be done through. I know you and I are having our conversation here through Zoom. So what are potential opportunities that don't violate HIPAA practices and and things of that nature that would let them do the telecounseling. That's wonderful. And I, I think, you know, as we put together the, the show notes for this 
I, I guess a question that I would probably go out to do, and, and maybe you could help with this when you go, if you could go back to your clients and I'll go to my contacts, what services, is there a number, a chapter, an association where individuals should go or to make the call? One of our guests earlier in the year was a suicide counselor. There are numbers you, you can call. And I think as family members, we can help, even help not only our spouses, our partners who are healthcare professionals, but also ourselves is, you know, if I'm a, the spouse, the partner of a healthcare professional, but that professional comes home, I know I can't just given the dangers of being in close contact, I can't necessarily have the type of contact and conversation that I would like. And I can, even myself, I suppose, seek out these counselors, not only for myself, but also offer it to my a suggestion to my partner. Um, so even I think the spouses, the partners can take on some of that initiative to at least make the connections, I, sus- I suspect. Sure. In other words, uh, serve as, a, as, as, as me sitting here at home as the husband or wife of a healthcare professional on the front lines, day-to-day patient care with COVID-19. How can I determine what resources may be available to assist myself and, and my spouse? One of the things that was shared with me is for doing this long term, day in and day out, working 12 hour shifts, having very little time off for you to get in a funk yourself as a healthcare provider. And one of the gentlemen that I talked with shared that he was really in a funk because he, he was asked to go over and, and work in these war torn countries and where these, if Ebola was prevalent and work in these situations because that's his skill set of being able to really rally people, put them together and lead those type of coalitions. And he said he really, the second time he came back, he was in a funk and everybody would ask, how can I help you? How can I help you? And finally he said, quit asking me, how can you help me? And so one of the physician friends says, all right, since you don't want me to help you, what can I get you that will allow you to help yourself? And he said it, it stopped him. And, and he said, all right, here's what I need. I need fertilizer. I, I need some plants. I need something I can do to garden and work in the yard. And, and he thought that that would be the end of it. Well, the next day, his physician friend and another person showed up and provided everything he needed to go out and work in the garden. And he said, that meant so much to me. And within two to three days, I was out of my funk because someone gave me the the necessary tools I needed to take care of myself. So that would be one of the things maybe for our our listeners and those in the healthcare world that you don't have to be providing healthcare to do this. What, What are some things that you love doing that you can find a way to do? but still do it and not be with a large group of people, more than 10 people or or being around people. And so creating those norms as much as possible. And in fact, I I heard the other day that lady, her daughter was supposed to have a bridal shower. And of course, now that we're down to no more than 10 people got to be six feet apart. The first thing they thought is, Oh my goodness, we've got to cancel the bridal shower. But here's what the idea turned into. Why don't we create a Zoom meeting and everybody that was coming over, you'll attend virtually. But before you do that, come over and put your gift on my front doorstep and then text me that you did it. I'll wait a few minutes and I'll bring the gift in. So as we're having the meeting and we can see each other, my daughter will open the gifts and we'll celebrate this virtually. So they found a way to be able to celebrate the bride and what in her marriage without having to cancel it and just being disappointed by it. That's another great opportunity to figure out ways to to have social interaction without really being close to each other. I think that is wonderful. I was just having a conversation this morning on, on a, in a mastermind group about the use of Zoom. I mean, Zoom is, I mean, you and I both know it. we've been using this tool for years and it's wonderful. And out on the, in the, on the social sites, There's a lot of folks initiating Zoom meetings, but I mean, that example, so, you know, the shower, the wedding, whatever, bar mitzvah, it's just, it's just a wonderful way for people to remain connected and a part of, even in a trying time to have a 
celebration of sort. And I do want to acknowledge something you said, John, is, you know, with the story about the, the doctor, you know, who was treating the uh, Ebola patients in Africa, or you didn't specify the, the country, the continent, but the two types of questions, you know, the first one is what can I do for you? And, and that can, and I can see if you could hear that every day, you just kind of get tired of it. It's like, just stop it. But I love the, the, the alternative, which was, what do you need from me? And I think perhaps that's another question uh, that we, as we're professionals of sort, we have a variety of skills, expertise, we have, we have networks is, for the practitioners that we know, or for the hospitals or the urgent care facilities, the doctor's office, is to ask that question, what do you need that I, that I can help you with? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I'm so glad you brought in the fact, like the primary care offices, just where I go to the, the doctor for, for my own appointments. And you know, the folks that are working that, being concerned, do you or don't you have it? Am I going to catch it? So, you know, I, I say this to all healthcare professionals. Thank you for having such a noble profession and that you're willing to go out and serve on the front line. And as, as Howard just mentioned, ask each other, what is it that I can get you? What, what is it you need from me? And, and come, come at it from more of a sincere versus how can I help you? Like it's almost urgent for you to help someone versus truly understanding what they need. So thank you, Howard, for bringing that back full circle. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I, I really uh, want to thank you too, John. I mean, you, you you took on this challenge that when I reached out to you that, I, hey, I wanted to do this. And I really am grateful that that you're able to take the time. And, and when you do have the opportunity for the, 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 the nurse practitioner and the physician, you know, thank them as well. And I, I think this is a great conversation, a dialogue. To have because we are in uncertain times and, you know, even, you know, in our space or my space, there's job loss everywhere. And if I can provide a service or I can do, if I can help somebody who's worried about their job, how do I overcome that? You know, it's certainly areas that I can, you know, I can make a difference in my own way. And I think many of us have unique ways that we can make a difference. And one thing that I've noticed here, and I don't know how it is in, in Northern Alabama, is all of those workers that are at the restaurants that are still open doing delivery or curbside delivery of food. I mean, that's been very big here in Chicago. Uh, or the, you know, I was just at, just at the grocery store yesterday. The team that's out there, you know, putting food and fruits and vegetables and meats out on the counters. And in, in the cases for you to buy, I mean, you know, we think about the healthcare practitioners and they are truly the front line, but so are these folks that are making minimum wage, their front line as well. And I, I don't think we can forget them either. Well, you know, I, I'm pleased to see how people are coming together and collaborating to help each other. Now, you're always going to have the five, 10 percent, right, who are in it for themselves. But it's just a beautiful thing that our nation, our group of people, and I assume around the world, we find a way to lift each other up in these tough times. And I, I think one of the big things I would say to our listeners is um, I, I was going through some counseling at one time and, and having some bouts of depression. And I said, yeah, I don't want to take medicine. I'm not a medicine person unless it's life or death. What do you suggest I do? And the counselor said, pretty simple, John, instead of going home today, go by the grocery store, buy some sandwiches or, or find people that you can help. Take your eyes off yourself, put your eyes on others and find a way to help them. When you do that, you're going to have a sense of value and a sense of worth. And I think one of the big things to our healthcare professionals on the front lines and to any of us, please, please do not develop a rut of thinking like here's how things should be because what should be is no longer. And what's going to come out of this, I believe is 
opportunities to make things better than we ever thought they could be before because normal has been disrupted. We have a new normal. Please get on board with finding ways to make things better. So, so, so be the person that improves, that, that has productive behavior versus disruptive behavior so that down the road, it's better for our young kids and young folks who are coming in behind us who are going to be responsible for this world 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now when I'm gone. You know, I think that 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 sentiment is so timely and whether you are a, are a follower of the politics of this nation or not, I mean, it's easy to, to just not want to even talk about it here, listen to it. And, but I've heard that what we're going through now in some ways is the wake up call, you know, the, 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 that new norm, as you talked about, I think we've reached that precipice. where We have to make a decision whether we're, you know, I've always used this term, all boats rise when the tide comes in. We've got to be a society that cares about, not necessarily cares for, but cares about everybody's well-being, not for, just for the select few. And I, I think you're right. When we come out of this, I hope there's no finger pointing. Uh, there's going to be lessons learned. What did we learn? How do we minimize this disruption or prevent it if it's that's possible. But how do we come out of this for the better so that everybody has the feeling that, you know, I can live free, you know, you know, have the, the, the have the things I need, you know, to support myself, my family, and my friends and my community. Yeah. So it, it goes back to that little line in our constitution, right? Let's let's make sure everybody has the the opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most definitely. Most definitely. John, thank you again so much for joining me today and just, you know, being available to have this conversation and maybe to hope, maybe we even will have created a new conversation that wasn't there before. But I really do appreciate you you taking the time out of your busy day to, to join me on the Success Insight podcast. Well, Howard, I appreciate it. And if you don't mind, I would like to use the acronym CALM, four steps for, for staying calm in uncertain times. And, and I'll just list them and won't add a lot of meat and potatoes to it. Is One is control your thoughts. Again, don't get caught in that, neg- that rut of negative thinking and, and everything is doomsday. So A is always be thankful. So I can imagine if we all stopped right now, we could write down a list of things that we are thankful for. You know, I'm thankful that my four children and my grandchildren all have food, that some of them are continuing to work, some of them can't, yet they have the necessities to be able to support and love each other over a certain amount of time. And the L is, and I'm going to throw in my higher power here, look to God for strength. So wherever you get get your strength, look to whoever that is. And then the M is minister to others. So whatever talents, strengths, and resources you have, use that to minister to others. It could be as simple as you've already shared. Maybe I, I, I don't need food from my local businesses right now, but if they got gift cards, couldn't I buy a gift card or two that would sustain them? I've got an elderly couple here just across the street from us, and my wife is always ministering to them with by carrying them food and canned goods, something they can just open and heat in a microwave. And I think ministering to others, too, that gives us that hope and sense of purpose that we can make a difference in this difficult time right now that we're going to work through as a nation and come out better. So thank you, Howard, for allowing me to come on and share with you today. And I really appreciate your input and dialogue during this time. My pleasure, John. And, and, hey, listen, before we go, I want to get, also give my listeners a way to get to know more about you and your work. I know you've got a website, you're on Twitter, you got LinkedIn. So where are the best places for them to go to learn more about you? Yeah, if they'll go to my website, power, P-O-W-E-R, the number two, transform.com. They can find my social media links there. Again, it's as you shared, I really focus on helping leaders uh, not blow up and clam up under pressure and help teams collaborate 
to innovate. And I'd also share on Amazon, if you're interested in, in a small read, it's my book, 52 Ways to Motivate Yourself. 52 Ways to Motivate Yourself, you can search for an Amazon. And the idea there is it's a one-year journey for learning to live a positive life in a complicated world, or we might say today in a topsy-turvy, uncertain world. And they can always feel free to reach out to me and just ask questions. I'll be glad to, to share my, my thoughts, especially during this difficult time, even if they just need someone to listen or bounce an idea off of me. Fantastic. John, we'll definitely provide the links back in our show notes to your website, Power to Transform, and to the page on Amazon as well. So once again, thank you so much and appreciate your time. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with John Bentley. John is the founder of Power to Transform Consulting. He's a leadership coach, speaker, trainer who works with healthcare organizations to develop emotionally intelligent leaders and collaborative team players. I reached out to John, just given the work that he performs working within healthcare institutions, just to get a sense of, in these uncertain times, how are we working with our healthcare professionals or practitioners, you know, throughout that organization, from the doctor down through the the, the aide, you know, that that's you know, helping the patient or the, you know, the individual who's cleaning up the rooms or in the hallways the food service, because they're all on the front lines and they're all going through a lot of stress and they need not only to to feel comfort and, and, and strength and being able to take care of themselves, with their be with their peers, take care of their work, but also to take care of their family and to take care of what they need. And I think as citizens who still have opportunities to, to give back, I think we should be asking them, you know, what can, what can I do for you? Or what do you need? Which is where John was going with that conversation. What do you need? And if there's a way we can help and make a difference, then I think that's an opportunity uh, for us to, you know, as we come out of this really uncertain times, how do we come out of it the better? And so we're truly taking care of each other. So uh, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Do comment in our notes. If you'd like to know more about us, you can visit successinsightpodcast.com. We are also on all of the social sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. So do, do visit us. Do let us know what you think. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a safe day, make a difference, and do take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Take care of your neighbor. We'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.